it started uh, by us noticing that our, that our LFP graphite cells um, show a really high reversible dis self discharge during a, um, a 500 hour storage period, especially if we did this at higher temperatures like 60 degrees Celsius and if these cells did not use any electrolyte additives. So um, we have a pretty nice setup in our um, lab that shows um, us exactly what, um, what part of the self-discharge that we are measuring is reversible and which one is irreversible. And in the case of these cells that had this high self-discharge, we saw a really high reversible self-discharge. So we were wondering, okay, how can we actually explain the self-discharge? And we looked into the self-discharge me mechanisms. Um, and there are basically four different, four different kinds of um, self-discharge mechanisms. The first one is an irreversible self-discharge, which is uh, due to SEI thickening. So the passivating layer on the anode gets thicker and therefore consumes lithium, which is not able to uh, be cycled between anode and cathode, which makes this uh, irreversible self-discharge. And then we have three different kinds of reversible self-discharge mechanisms. There is the electrolyte oxidation, which means one part of the electrolyte or one electrolyte component is basically oxidized. And in order to balance this charge, a lithium ion has to go from the anode back to the cathode, which means self-discharge. But this is, for our cells, it's just mathematically impossible because in order to explain the reversible self-discharge, we see that we, we would have to consume more electrolyte in the cell than there even is in our cell. So we knew, okay, this is not a mechanism that can explain our, um, this, this, this high self-discharge. Then a second self-discharge mechanism that is reversible is the so-called transition metal dissolution, which means transition metals um, dissolve from the cathode. In the case of LFP, it would be iron. In the case of NMC, it would be nickel, manganese, or cobalt. Um, and then this transition metal um, um, goes to the anode. And in order to balance the charge again, the lithium ion would have to um, integrate from the anode to the cathode, into the cathode, and um, this would be self-discharge as, as well. So we looked at the anode and we just found negligible amounts of, of transition metal. So we could also be sure that this is not our self-discharge mechanism that can explain this behavior. And then we were just left with one uh, self, uh, reversible self-discharge mechanism, which is the redox shuttle molecule. Um, and this is what I have investigated in, in, in the two papers, basically. And the redox shuttle molecule can, um, for example, be oxidized on the cathode, travel to the anode, gets reduced there, um, and travels back to the cathode. And this can happen over and over again. And in order to, to balance this charge, when this shuttle molecule has always been oxidized, reduced, lithium ions have to travel from the anode back to the cathode, which means um, you have reversible self-discharge. So we now have wanted to know, okay, we have now identified that our reversible self-discharge is um, due to a redox shuttle molecule. So we were interested in how is this created in the first place and what redox shuttle molecule is this actually? So I did uh, cells with, with many different electrolytes and the formation at different temperatures for these cells. And what we notice is that especially if you use additives that have no SEI building properties, so that are not known for enhancing the SEI in your lithium ion cell, or if you use no additives at all, and you do formation, especially at higher temperatures like 55 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Celsius, you get a high self discharge. So we knew, okay, this might be the electrolyte. These might this might be the electrolytes that um, that contain redox shuttle molecules, um, and we then took these electrolytes and did so-called 
GCMS with it. It stands for Gas Chromatography Mass Spectrometry. And um, this was then our main analysis technique, um, which was used um, in order to, to identify which is actually, what is actually a redox shuttle molecule. So what we found when we um, tried to identify this redox shuttle molecule was that um, this redox shuttle molecule was dimethyl tereftalate, um, in short DMT, which is pretty interesting and um, we were uh, surprised. Um, and this DMT um, is, is, has a, a benzene ring, like many redox shuttle molecules, so we're pretty sure, okay, this might be the one. Plus, um, if it is reduced, this DMT molecule turns red. So initially the electrolyte is clear um, and when now the redox shuttle molecule is in it and gets reduced, it turns red. And this is a really interesting observation because we saw this in also the electrolytes that um, had a high, a high self discharge. So um, basically we had, we had a double proof. We had this like discoloration of the electrolytes, which means there's shuttle molecule in it. Plus we had our experimental setup that could, um, that could um, show, okay, there is this redox shuttle molecule in this electrolyte. So the interesting thing about this DMT redox shuttle molecule is that it comes from PET. This was found by my colleague Anu Adamson, uh, who is a PhD student in, uh, in Dalhousie University, together with um, Tom Bertischer, who joined there after me. And so they found DMT must, must come from PET. Um, and we were su pretty surprised because we were thinking, okay, but for sure there is no PET in our lithium ion cells. Where should PET come from? Um, and I'm really investigated this then and just tear the part the pouch cells that we are using in our uh, lab in, in Dalhousie University. We have like a Chinese supplier for these pouch cells. And she found that there is this tape which holds together the jelly roll. So basically the stack of, of electrolyte, uh, electrodes and um, separator. And it turned out that this is out of PET. At the first moment, we were a little disappointed because this is not even an active component and we did so much work and now we found out it's this, it's this silly tape. But um, as it turned out, this tape is pretty standard in the lithium ion battery cell industry. So a lot of um, companies are using this tape um, and this is basically what um, uh, what made my work now so, so prominent and, and big um, that, um, that, that we also got this media hype because it's an easy to understand message. Okay, tape leads to self-discharge and it's an actual problem for many um, cell manufacturers. But we are especially proud as well that um, it's um, um, not only a media hype, <laughs> it's also um, uh, something uh, our professional colleagues are looking into and both papers, I'm really proud, um, are, the, are placing number one and two for one month already in the Journal of the Electrochemical Society um, for most read. This is pretty cool. <laughs> so there are a few things that you can look into um, now. So what is obvious and should be um, investigated first is with what could you replace the PET tape? Because you don't want um, any, even, even if cell manufacturers, and we can't tell for sure, um, use additives that for sure prevent this DMT creation for some time. These additives can be consumed at some point and then there could be um, DMT that um, is released into the cell. Plus, even if this is not the case, you just don't want to use a tape that can dissolve in your electrolyte. Why would you want this if you can prevent it? So you should uh, look for alternatives. That's the third thing in order to, to get rid of the PET. 
And another thing is, of course, to understand this um, DMT shuttle process even further and how exactly it is shuttling from anode to cathode um, and how it's, it's generated exactly. There is um, also a diag uh, there's also a figure in my, um, in my second paper that already shows how this, um, how this DMT molecule is uh, generated. But uh, of course, you can look further into this.